that's the way they have retold history. I mean, that's what's super interesting about this quote, which is why I think it is a great way to start out with. And yes, we are back in the root of history chapter. We're not to John T. Mond yet. We're back in the root of history. So, but what she, this is actually, it's actually one of my favorite chapters of the book, which is about how, so they've taken these events that all happened in May, and there's some events in May that the country, the state celebrates, but there's others that uh, the state, the official histories are narrated through a discourse of failure, 1802 being represented as collective suicide in 1967 as a senseless massacre. This is when workers got killed and then the reinstitution of slavery are rescued as expressions of resistance and refusal. Felicia's right. They are they take these historical events. And this is something we were talking about in the last class is how do you take historical events and read them in the context of your political commitments in the present? How do you then reinterpret the past? And this is exactly the way Felicia described it. They retell these things, not as like senseless things, but as sensible manifestations of constant struggle. How do they do that? How do they make history work for them this way? Unfortunately, Megan can't be here to give us her quote, but it'd be hugely important. How do you make history do this? Do you get it from the classroom and the lectures? Do you get it from the people? How? What do you do? Huh? <laughs> This is one of my favorites because it basically says that what I'm doing is kind of silly, kind of useless. You really don't get the, I mean, you get, you get something from it. You get a certain kind of knowledge from just listening and reading. But what do you really need to do to make this history work for you? Experience it. You need to go on one of these beautiful memory walks which actually sound pretty difficult because you have to trudge along. And they're not like the ones that have little placards. You're just marching through a mall or past a old abandoned airport and you're looking around and the route changes all the time. But it's these incredible walks in which, and this one person says it very, you know, like I said, it validates, actually it validates what Hartwig used to say we did, which was experiential learning all those things. This is on page 144. They talk about the difference between you know, sub, or two different senses of knowing things, two different words in French for it. Um, in my opinion, by just being told history in a lecture hall, I wouldn't have known or understood or been able to explain that history to others. But by participating in the memory walks, I feel like I lived through those events. I was there, I was in it. And so the they, they use these memory walks. It's really brilliant to sort of bring out the natural landscape and introduce people to foods and really feel this history as something that's resonating in them. Again, we're not saying that this is what, you know, that this is what actually happened, but it does something here is that as Bonilla quotes, we'll quote within a quote though, that history becomes something that you can do something with, that you're an, a person who's an actor within history and is not just one damn thing after another. You might remember that I quoted the one damn thing after another. It's a very famous quote about history, maybe even a quote from a historian about history. And <laughs> it's like, what, what's the purpose of this? And we talked about that a little bit with Chris Lane's book, The Danger of history becoming one damn thing after another, but a purposeful series of events. And so what she's saying here is by doing these memory walks and by calling these things and con you know, congealing them into these places, they're able to uh, make history into a, a kind of path as a, as a way in which you are heading in a certain direction, which again is not necessarily it's not true that history has an inherent direction, but you can make it work for you. 
And then we get to the last chapter, and uh, the memory walks are important because they they are are a way in which people start to experience the union. The union is, and the strike has always been larger than simply what we consider to be a strike. It has the involvement of society in it, being on the picket line, shutting down whole sectors of society. And in 2009, we have one of the biggest mobilizations ever. And, uh, and there, John Timon. Right, not, they shut the whole society down in a way, but they haven't used, remember back in the, in the modest Tommy affair, there was some pretty, uh, some pretty uh, property destruction and stuff like that going on. So this seems to be, people are like, oh yeah, this is great. You're eschewing, eschewing violent tactics, not using violent tactics and carrying out peaceful protests. Do you like this, Liam? You like the peaceful protest, not the violent tactics. And yeah. What do you think, Marcus? Do you like the peaceful tactics, not the violent protest? <laughs> it's just a trick question. <laughs> I mean, actually, I, I, I pondered for a second. I can't do it now because I'm not as quick on Google as you all. But I pondered for a second. There's a very famous picture of, of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X like meeting each other and shaking hands. And basically, like agreeing on a whole bunch of stuff, and I I like this quote that you had. You know, when as as Bonilla put it, when people start, I think this is somebody talking about this. They're like, "Hey, wait a second, this jaunty mod stuff isn't working. We're ready to do something else." Some people have said, and I don't know. You know, like Martin Luther King is a very complicated person, as is Malcolm X. Some people have said that they were kind of like working together in a way. It's like, you don't like me? This guy's, you know, if you don't like what I'm doing, the peaceful side, here's this other guy. That's your alternative. So, you know, that they were kind of, in some ways, playing each other off. And in fact, many of the anti-Martin Luther, by the way, they, we we did, we we do have Martin Luther King Jr. Day now, and we... We didn't take it off for this class, but you know, it's a big national thing. Back in the day, people hated this guy, right? He was reviled. And a lot of the people said he is advocating violence because he's telling people to stand up or sit down, stand up. And he's saying do it nonviolently, but the problem is there's going to be a reaction. So it's going to turn this way. So they would, anyway. I like Marcus, I like what you said because. For one thing, you're very subtle. You started off with this. What is the role of peaceful protest to sort of draw us into the quote? And then you ask this bigger question, which is, I think, really interesting. And I think true, right? And we don't have to necessarily agree, but we can see that in history, you can see it right now. <laughs> you can turn on the news and see it. You're always saying, all right, what you're going to see, I mean, God, this uh, the the police stuff that's going on and the the video that's being released and the the people are like all right what you're gonna see is really bad so be peaceful <laughs> you know and it's like holy god how bad is it gonna be if you have to tell people in advance that it's gonna be so bad that you better not overreact right and so it and it's always it is true like people of color are always being told hey don't be messing around with anything Whereas, at least in my experience, I think that it is also true that if some the white people get up and do something, either celebrate it, like the American Revolution, good job, guys, or it's like, oh, yeah, of course they're going to feel that way. Now, you might tell me, yeah, but aren't they prosecuting all those people in, what's that thing we just had? Not just that. When they were storming the Capitol, January 6th. Aren't they getting down on those people, prosecuting them? But just imagine, let's just imagine for 20 seconds, maybe only two seconds, what would have happened if those people had been storming the Capitol and had been black? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> it would have been our hour a little. It would have been bad. So, I mean, I think it's worth reflecting on this. I think, Mark, as it's true, you know, things like the Haitian Revolution, we don't learn about that. We learn about the American Revolution. We even learn about the French Revolution, although we don't like the French Revolution either. But we learn about it. We don't learn about the Haitian Revolution. We learn about Martin Luther King. We Sometimes we learn about Mar Malcolm X. We take a special class. Sometimes, sometimes we do. So, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's interesting to reflect on this. Again, nobody's saying, nobody's saying people should be violent. It's just the way people are portrayed. And as soon, and it's also the way people are portrayed as soon as images of people come out doing whatever they're doing, they're assumed to be violent. Either they're, there's nonviolent. So, you know, that's another whole thing in contrast oh actually there are several points in this chapter where Bonilla used the words in contrast in contrast is always something that you have to look out for they didn't see it because it was all televised so usually I mean what she's saying in contrast is it's usually in these strikes like the union would walk out I mean they'd be like oh you workers you're, you're breaking down you're not negotiating got to negotiate with us on this debt limit thing, negotiate. And then this time, the other people walk out and everybody sees it. And they're like, what? And so they learn all sorts of things about the relationship in society. It actually leads to some pretty amazing stuff. I mean, they shut down the whole place. They have a quarter, almost per, at one time, I think they had a quarter of the population on the streets. You saw the video. They have a whole song for it. It's a, you know, it's a huge thing. They get all this stuff. They get, they get a lot of their demands met. They have a lot of things go well from this, actually. You know, they learn things. They have their demands met. Except then what happens? Amy is from being portrayed as almost as pretty close to a white guy to becoming blacker and blacker as the protests progress. But um, the uh, which says something, Marcus, to your whole, like, how people change, right? At first, he's, they're like, yeah, that guy, he's very light-skinned, and then he gets, like, his afro seems to grow on TV and in real life. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he says, the mode himself, we failed. We failed. Now, well, uh-oh, we're all the way to Regina. Look. Regina, what what would you say back to this? Or what would Bonilla say back to this? We failed. And I think she's saying, right, the idea that you can judge everything by success or failure straight up, right? It's either one or the other, yes or no, is uh, is not the way you should you should categorize social movements. And so her her final chapter, of course, is called Hope and Disappointment. From page 172, a few pages before where Regina is, it would be easy to read these disappointments as signs of political failure, extinguished dreams, exhausted options, yet further evidence of a contemporary political dead end. But I would like to suggest otherwise, for disappointment is always intimately bound with hope. Disappointment proves that apathy has not settled in. He says disappointment is different from regret. Even if Antillians have become disillusioned with the project for the post-colonial era, they still have faith in the possibilities of collective action and in their own individual abilities to transform their daily lives. Their political projects might not resemble the nationalist struggles of a previous era. So again, she's getting at that they're not, it's not the same as these sort of revolutionary nationalisms. And indeed, they may be harder to quantify, measure, assess, and even recognize since they do not involve grand gestures of state overthrow or the large scale projects of social engineering associated with modernized, modernist statecraft. So it's not like they're necessarily trying to overthrow the state, bring in a new government, get independence, all those things. But, and then she quotes Deborah Thomas, another Caribbeanist, 
we if we if we only have our mind on this nationalist revolution, we are sure to miss the many unspectacular transformations that abound in the daily re recreations of ordinary life. So again, what's saying here is the, the idea that they, they have disappointment is also a sign that they've realized their collective ability to influence things and can still have hope for social transformation. 